I'd like to introduce Kirsten Hestrup to you. Um, thank you for being here. It's a very, Thanks. very great honor that you are with us. Um, Kirsten is a Danish anthropologist and professor of anthropology at the University of Copenhagen. She's had a distinguished career, including being president of the Royal Danish Academy of Sciences and Letters from 2008 to 2016. <coughs> Kirsten's work has taken a special interest in the conjunction between the history and culture, culture of Iceland and Greenland, publishing widely on Icelandic history and society, on human rights and legal language, on theatre and social action, and on the beginnings of Danish anthropology in early polar expeditions. So we're not only talking about the monsoon at this symposium. In addition to these more specialized fields, she has published cr critical explorations of the philosophical and epistemological foundations of anthropology, textbooks on anthropology, and in general introduction to the history of the human sciences and their contribution to society. Her Icelandic work spans the entire history of the island society and traces the intricate links between environmental changes, notably the warm Middle Ages and the later Little Ice Age. In recent years, Kirsten's work has centered on the environmental and social changes in Greenland, where she has started a series of field works in a small hunting community with the aim of studying local perceptions of threats and opportunities, and this is a five-year-long process. From 2004 to 2014, Kirsten ran Water Worlds, which was an ERC project analyzing social responses to climate change. And this is where I came across her work when I was um, preparing my ERC grant proposal. This, this ERC grant um, looked at climate change in three environments, um, the melting ice, which was a study of the Arctic and glacier-covered mountains elsewhere that were threatened by, that were threatening age-old ways of living and moving within the landscape. She then looked at the rising seas, which are, were potentially flooding islands and, and coastal communities. And the th final theme was the dying lands, um, looking at um, water-scarce regions um, where hunger, displacement of people, and political instability um, were evident. So you can, from this extraordinary oeuvre of work, we are really excited to have you with us today. Thank you for being here. <coughs> Thank you very much for this wonderful introduction and not least for inviting me to speak here today to, to this uh, symposium, which I, I think you can hear me now. I, I can hear my own voice much better at least. And uh, I've also, I, I hope you've noted the change up here because now you can actually see the faces you're both ways. I managed to have these screens moved. It took one and a half days <laughs> before it worked. <laughs> but here we are, and I'm very happy to be here. And as Lindsay just said, my work uh, centers most recently over the past 10 years, actually, in the high Arctic region. And I have chosen my introductory picture to, to be this globe as seen from the North Pole. And the little uh, red arrow indicates the place where I've been working over the past 10 years on and off, coming back in different seasons, different, re uh, different years, and, and seeing what happened as time went by to this sort of area of melting ice. But as for the notion of water literacy that frames my argument, it has been nourished by my work with the Water World Project, the name of this collective ERC research project exploring new ways in which water configures social worlds. The actual configurations, as we demonstrated, were not necessarily inevitable. They were always responses made within a particular social and imaginative horizon. It is this interface between the natural and the social histories that I worked to theorize over a number of years, based on fieldwork in different places, notably in sub-Arctic Iceland and in high Arctic Northwest Greenland. If the Arctic seems far away from the region of monsoons, there is little doubt that both regions are currently troubled by changes of wind, weather and water, and that they are equally implicated in global climate trends, even 
and even affecting each other in so many hidden ways. The water world's focus on water make, made unlikely regional comparisons possible, so to speak. The group of 15 people who were part of the project and did individual fieldworks worked in different regions from the Pacific re Islands, the Southeast Indian uh, coast, the Arctic and the high Arctic landscape, the Sahel zone, desert Mauritania, the glacier rich South America, and so on. All of these regions had manifest troubles with water. There was either too much of it or too little, or it came at the wrong moment or in the wrong kind like water instead of ice, for instance. And different kinds of water could be in conflict with, with each other, i.e. salt water and seawater. Out of the distinct fieldworks and our evolving conversations, a deep sense of the configurative power of water emerged, spurring the question of how to read water to better understand its unruly influence on community life. Another initial inspiration derived initially from oceanographers setting up a network and calling for ocean literacy, i.e. a more comprehensive understanding of the ocean's influence on you and your influence on the ocean, to cite uh, something from their web page. And this again reminds us of Fernand Brodel's comprehensive analysis uh, of the Mediterranean uh, in the 16th century, of life and politics in the 16th century, showing how the slow rhythm of raising and falling seas, uh, rising and falling seas, infiltrated the political development and suggesting that historical conjunctures are deeply embedded in large scale natural processes that are not necessarily perceptible within the time frame of a lived life. Studies from other seas and their coastal fringes equally show how the historicity of the ocean stretches to the farthest corners of the earth. We know now how the Pacific Islands emerged and disappeared as centuries passed by, and how they became populated or depopulated by brilliant navigators following the deep human instinct to move, and as the sea changed, they became stuck in some places. When it comes to monsoon waters, the sea and the winds are equally partners in the making of history, as are people, of course, who are not only victims of a new kind of unpredictability, but also the interpreters, whence again the need for water literacy. So this leads me to the first part of my paper here, calling water sociality or the spatial ramifications of life. And I shall take off from my own field as an example of water sociality and the configurative power of water. You will know how th about the dwindling ice, of course, and ice, of course, is a kind of water. And while for some people in some places this may seem positive, in the high Arctic Thule it is a major challenge. The sea ice was and still is a major connector between people and places along the coast and between people and their prey, but now it is less reliable than before, with the sea opening up earlier each spring. The population was always very scant. Today it counts some 750 people, most of them living in the town of Kranach, the main town, and in the three remaining settlements, where they're all of them hunting along a ragged coastline spanning around a thousand kilometers. So it's a quite a big stretch of land that they cover through their movements and preferably on the sea ice, that is the great connector was. The sea and the sea ice have been major players in the configuration of the community ever since the early immigrations from Canadian Arctic into the Tula region. And the latest immigration wave was around 1200 in our era. So it, it's, it's relatively recent. Before that, Greenland had been sort of more or less empty of people for generations. Once there, people used all available local materials for some purpose or other. Stone for meat catchers and graves, stone and turf for winter houses, skin and wooden poles for summer tents with stones to keep them in place, still discernible as tin rings on the stony ground. These materials uh, have been uh, offered up by the landscape. Indeed, they are part of it, whether inanimate or animate. 
The stone used also for construction of stone and turf houses were plucked directly from the landscape and often derived from rocks moved in, moving in millions of years ago. And these sort of co competing temporalities in any one landscape is what Doreen Massey has called a provocation of landscape. And certainly, I mean, this landscape is full of provocations of that kind. Wooden poles came with the drift eyes and skins were prepared from game of various kinds. And you can still see, this is a very recent picture, and you can see these sort of materials are still in, in, in very much use. The list of materials is not necessarily surprising, but it is deceptive for its alignment of different materials, omitting their individual historicity. Each thing can be unpacked and put in a separate perspective, showing the vibrancy of matter, to paraphrase Jane Bennett, who wants to theorize a materiality that is as much force as entity, as much energy as matter, as much intensity as extension. To substantiate this, and to give you some water to think with, uh, I shall concentrate on one kind of material that have played a major role in the making of the Thule community, past and present, namely wood. Something of an irony in an absolutely treeless high arctic, but all the more telling for that. Wood was always vital to both transport and hunt. And it's, it's worth here remembering that the, the early immigrations came from the, the Canadian Arctic and there were sort of forests somewhere in there. So wood wasn't an unknown thing when they, but it became depleted, the resource became depleted when they came to, to Northwest Greenland. Um, but anyway, wood was always vital to both transport and hunt. The Umiak, that is the large communal skin boat that brought the Thule Inuit to Greenland around 1200, the kayak and the dog sledge that entered at the same time, all of them required a strong and flexible wooden framework apart from everything else. Harpoons, bows and arrows likewise depended on access to some measure of wood. When waters at the top of the Baffin Bay were and are now opening du open during summer, driftwood became available in this otherwise absolutely treeless region delivered by the West Greenlandic current. And you can see it here, it's a blue current moving up along the west coast of Greenland and connecting with polar currents from elsewhere. And there's another picture here which is, I mean, in, it, it, the words are a bit slug. <laughs> uh, unreadable here, but still you get the general picture of, of the driftwood ultimately deriving from the polar sea, often brought there by rivers from the vast Canadian or mainly the Siberian landscapes due to the actual sort of patterns of currents in the polar uh, region. The polar current sort of driving it all was in permanent motion, moving down the eastern shores of Greenland, carrying also the huge icebergs that have always made traffic on the North Atlantic a dangerous affair, and turning round Cape Farewell at the southern tip of Greenland before moving up along the west coast of, of, of Greenland. And through this natural transport system, the polar current gave vital energy to social life in northwest Greenland by its capacity for bringing driftwood to the shores, at least to the southern parts of it, um, from where it could be transported further north by the people uh, traveling on the ice. And you could see the West Greenlandic current would deliver the goods here at the southern point of Tula, and then it, it would be sort of ferried further on the ice uh, to the entire region here. And you should realize also that there's a huge stretch of uninhabited lands there, so there wasn't any possibility of bartering or moving, and because they, they'd be locked in by the ice. And they still are for the better part of the year, but not all the year now. But in the Tula region, driftwood became inaccessible during the Little Ice Age, that is from normally between 1350 to 1800. I mean, scales are, are sort of rough at, at, because we're looking back on, on sort of different kinds of evidence. Because of the packed ice in the Baffin Bay would prevent the West Greenlandic current from delivering the goods. And this, of course, signific significantly weakened the material basis of hunting life. Deanimating in its process, as it were, 
yet also in a very important and interesting sense reanimating it by the invention of sledges made entirely out of whale and walrus bone. And you can see a specimen here that was uh, uh, acquired by John Ross, who was the first one to report on these people. They'd been out of sight also from people in southern Greenland for 300 years and forgotten. And they'd forgotten almost everything about their one-time neighbors down south. So they had been truly isolated. So, and, but when Marcel Moss, a renowned anthropologist, wrote about the Eskimo, Eskimos in the Thule district in 1906, not based on fieldwork, but on all available records, he noted their extreme poverty and emphasized the lack of driftwood, concluding that these unfortunate Eskimo were reduced to such uh, circumstances that they retain merely the memory of their former technology." End of quote. In actual fact, even the memory was fading after two or three centuries of being closed in by the sea ice. It took some immigrating kinsfolk from Baffinland, traveling across Smith Sound, that is a little sound between Canada and Greenland, in the late 1860s to truly asse assess the magnitude of the loss, however and to reinvigorate forgotten technologies. At this time, the population was down to 100 people. Very tiny and just sort of on the verge of, of extinction, in a sense. But they made it. <laughs> um, the general point um, is that the global process of cooling during the Little Ice Age, originating in the Earth's own geological history, deeply impinged on the life of the tiny population of the high north. In face of this, the 15 newcomers uh, from America in the 1860s made a huge difference. And again, the clash of scales here bears noticing. An old man from the group of American immigrants, uh, this is sort of the closest we get to a picture <laughs> of, uh, of, of, of people from this time, well, who was still alive when Knud Rasmussen, the Danish explorer, arrived in 1903, told him, and I quote here from Rasmussen's work, we told them to build kayaks and to hunt from kayaks. Before that, they had only hunted on the ice and had been obliged during the spring to catch as many seals, walruses, and narwhals as they would want for the summer when the ice had gone. End of quote. Other technologies, such as bows and arrows, were likewise reinvented, and with a more stable provision of wood from the European sailors, forgotten technological skills could be restored quite quickly, actually. And some of these technologies still play a central role in the hunting activities in the North. New uh, uh, technologies, of course, have been brought in by the foreigners, but the basic instruments for hunting and moving are still the same. Thus, for instance, these kayaks are brand new and made ready for the summer's open water narwhal hunt. In spite of its being a non-native resource, wood was a vital part of the larger assemblage of ice, sea currents, explorers and encounters, an agent in its own right, making the landscape either shrink or expand in terms of its potential allowing different game, kinds of game to be hunted, opening or closing opportunities as the ice allowed, and as the sea currents made possible. What we are faced with here is the con configurative power of global water in the long term. But what does this observation do to the notion of a local landscape? How far does it stretch when the agency of its material parts points to the place as co-constituted by matters of different temporalities and spatial connections of different climates and immigrants from elsewhere. Jane Bennett's vision of agentive as assemblages t leads us towards an important question concerning the sovereignty of language and the ways it is put to use in singling out what matters. And I quote her here. But what if we loosen the tie between participation and human language use, encountering the world as a swarm of vibrant materials entering and leaving agentive assemblies. We might then entertain a set of crazy and not so crazy questions. Do sandstorms make a difference to the spread of so-called sectarian violence? 
Can a hurricane bring down a president? Can an avian virus jump from birds to humans and create havoc for systems of health care and international trade and travel? End of quote. Thinking back to the driftwood, I would like to add another question. Can logs lost in the river by Siberian woodcutters keep a community in northwest Greenland with meat? Yes. Even such small event matters in the complex processes that make a landscape, as we have seen. Bennett's vision to acknowledge the non-human multitude as something more than context, constraint or tool, and seeing them instead as participants in the global, um, in the political ecology on which, of which humans are also part. Rather than fixing materiality as a stable thinginess, it is more productive, she says, to theorize a materiality that is as much force as entity, as much energy as matter, as much intensity as extension, as I just quoted her for. I think Bennett's notion of vibrant matter and distributive agency acknowledge the powers vested in relations rather than things, and this adds to the prov provocation that the lived landscape always is, including the enigmatic sea, of course. This observation also fits the Pacific Ocean, equally susceptible to the climatic shifts through the medieval warm period and the Little Ice Age, respectively, as described and analyzed by Patrick Nunn very elaborately. During the former, sailing across the Pacific and peopling most of the islands was relatively easy, probably due to the prevailing winds. Evidence shows how the sea levels rose slowly during the warm years, only to fall abrupt, abruptly up to as much as 135 centimeters, and on average 70 to 80 centimeters, which is quite a lot, uh, during the so-called AD 1300 event, the name given to the abrupt cooling that replaced the warm medieval period. The cooling was in all probability probability also accompanied by greater storminess. And it's of course because the ice would bound up, bind up the water now as, as it is now sort of releasing it again. So we have this sort of this uh, co-variance or inverted variance between ice and, and sea levels. And so that again is something that links the, the Arctic to, to the Pacific for, for instance. The Pacific development in its own way mirrors the situation in the North Atlantic, where the, early tr the easy travels of the Norsemen during the medieval warm period enabled them to settle um, on the Faroe Islands, Iceland and the southern parts of Greenland and even to on the eastern coast of America, facilitated by the easy North Atlantic, by the favorable North Atlantic winds and easy seas. By contrast, the ensuing period from 1400 on, and onwards made Iceland an, almo an almost impossible place to live, at least in the old ways, as peasants, and the Norsemen would soon disappear from both Greenland and the American coast, because communication failed. And the Icelanders were severely impoverished and went starving for centuries, just like people in northwest Greenland were, were starved because they were no longer, no longer connected to the outer world. So what we have here in these sort of, these sort of turns from the Middle Ages to the Little Ice Age is a global climatic de development now acknowledged as of direct historical impact. In the North Atlantic, the times of plenty of the Middle Ages were replaced by the times of less during the ensuing cooling as they were in Pacific and it's his terms in Patrick Nunn's terms that I'm using here. It is certainly no simple a relation of cause and effect, but there is no doubt that the shifting seas had a major impact upon the configuration of society and the patterns of uh, habi habitation. So, but things again began to change in the north. And while you can see in this picture, you can see the North Atlantic has become entirely mythical. There's very little concrete knowledge about what's actually happening there. And uh, because sailing has become a rare matter. But um, by in, in, in sort of around 1700 and late 17th century, a new interest from Europe began uh, also in, in, in Greenland. And you can see here that 
that um, this is a painting, a romantic painting of Dutch whalers in the sort of southwestern Greenlandic seas, sort of whaling and catching uh, ice polar bears and what have you, and seals are all over the place. So it's a very sort of unlikely <laughs> event, but it does it does uh, speak to the fact that the Greenlandic seas are beginning to open up to foreign interest, and one could even uh, one could even say that this sort of new European interest in the Greenlandic waters and the game there was sort of the beginning of the Anthropocene uh, uh, in in Greenland. As recently noted by Eivind Pasche and Erik Bonstorf in an article on the Wicked Ocean. We need to balance our conventional land-based perspective on climate change with a more refined view of the ocean, which is so much more than a surface. While driftwood evidently was ferried along with surface waters and sea ice around Greenland, we need to better understand the entire engine of ocean circulation and the sinking of surface water, an engine that helps us maintaining the balance in the Earth's climate. I have this from this article. Um, and I quote them here, on a human time scale, the ocean engine is slow, given the volume in question, explaining why it can take 1,200 to 1,500 years before submerged surface water in the Pacific Ocean reach the deepest parts of the basin, or even longer before it resurfaces, all depending on which ocean and which water mass you examine, end of quote. So once again, we are faced with a water engine that sort of formats, or at least co-formats, the historicity of water. In the process by which we, the humans, have created modern society through an industrial revolution, with all that implies of contamination of the sea, we have created, and I quote this article again, a series of wicked problems where the solution we propose oftentimes trigger new problems or are merely covering up new sins. A significant part of the new problems relate to the unprecedented impingement of anthropogenic forces upon the natural processes, highlighting and further complicating the spatial and temporal ramifications of social life. And now to the second part on non-scalability and the na nature of fluid worlds. From the configurative power of seawater, we shall now turn our interest towards the non-scalable quality of fluid worlds, defying the simple understanding of the hy hydrological engine. For centuries, hydrology strived to define and isolate water from both history and society, abstracting it from the messiness of real landscapes. And this has been very uh, fine, analyzed very well by uh, Jamie Linton in his book from 2010. Popular depictions of the hydrological circle abound, and you know them all, I'm sure. And what they share is their suggestion that what we are dealing with is a system in balance. It has become so obvious that it is often even seen as one of nature's grand, grand plans, it is argued somewhere. And in the Handbook of Hydrology from 1993, it is described in the following way. The hydrological, and I quote here, from uh, maidment in this handbook. The hydrological circle is the most fundamental principle of hydrology. Water evaporates from the oceans and the land surface, is carried over the earth in atmospheric circulation as water vapor, precip precipitates again as rain or snow, is intercepted by trees and vegetation, provides a runoff on the land surface, infiltrates into soils, recharges groundwater, discharges into streams, and ultimately flows out into the oceans, from which it, it will eventually evaporate once again. This immense water engine, fueled by solar energy, driven by gravity, proceeds endlessly in the presence of or absence of human activity. As pointed out by Linton and before him by Tuan and since both of them, many other people, the actual hydrological forces are, of course, deeply marked by a human story. The system is far from stable, and human action, social demands, and political priorities always infiltrate measurement and preferences. In other words, water is never ever an abstraction when seen from the point of view of humans and lived by them, who experience its many forms and forces. 
whether in the shape of ice, snow, seas, waves, rain, rivers, floods, swamps, well springs, groundwater, dew, steam, whatever. It comes in really many forms, each of which engender particular meanings and sensations and makes certain social forms possible or prohibitive. While certainly natural, albeit in different ways, water is also very much material, political, biopolitical, and poses a deep challenge to the nature-society binary. Focusing on water, uh, which is, I mean, we have to do away with the line between them anyway. <laughs> we know that. But, but, but water itself sort of makes us realize that or points us in the same direction. Focusing on water means letting it co-format the analysis and allowing it to determine the bounds of the field, which are not always given. Malinowski is the sort of old-time anthropologist, one of the founders of the discipline in the early 20th century. Uh, his studies of the Trobian Islands spring to mind because, his close, because of his close attention to the actualities of social life made him sense that the islands were connected rather than separated across the sea and that the social unfolded by way of canoes as much as by way of gardening and chanting for a good harvest. He did not make a very theoretical point out of it, he just told it as it was. More recently, other ocean ethnographies of a slightly different kind have made more of the sea as an agent, such as, for instance, Katharina Schneider's succinct, succinct analysis, analysis of saltwater sociality in Melanesia from 2012. She studied a community of fishermen islanders living off a larger uh, island and showed how movement was a predominant mode of objectifying social relations, suggesting that movements should be seen as objects in their own right. Um, this, initial, this installs fluidity into objects, constantly changing form and showing the contingency of outcomes. The force of this example lies with the ways in which the fluid social forms and values permeate the sense of social relations in a wide and ever-widening world of connections. We also know the implications of this in the long-term development of human history in, in the Pacific, and we rediscover it in Stefan Helmreich's ethnography of the alien ocean. Helmreich dived into the microbial seas and the world of marine biologists. In the process, he encountered global networks of science, of capitalism, of global waste, and of activism that showed how deeply even the oceans of the planet are now integrated in the global social processes often talked about as if they belonged exclusively to the land masses and their inhabitants. Helmreich was moved towards a recognition of the need to rethink theory and taxonomy in a fluid world. So these examples substantiate and, in a sense, extend Henri Lefebvre's view about spatial history, implying that space is both where a historical plot unfolds and simultaneously constituted as a place by history itself. The more general point here is that in fluid worlds, both taxonomy and causality lose their power over our minds. That is to be hoped, at least. This lead me, leads me back to my North Arctic hunters. Of course, they're ever present also in the, uh, in the stream of pictures here. Uh, yeah, no, I won't talk about it. <laughs> Uh, um, living around the North Water, and that is a very special feature of their region. It's, it's a so-called Polynya, or a high Arctic oasis, that for very sort of intricate hydrological and oceanographic and, and biological reasons is kept open for the better part of the year. Uh, and this patch of uh, Arctic sea, uh, open sea, form, forms a productive oceanic space both in terms of primary biomass, crustaceans, fish, and a wealth of birds and marine mammals higher up the food chain, benefiting from the feeding and breathing space offered by the open water oasis. And of course, this is the only reason why people can live there in the first place, because they live off these animals that congregate there. And are by bi biologists, they are described as forming a sea ice community 
and it's and, and um, is generally depicted as if the inhabitants are sort of there at the same time and being sort of part of the same game uh, and and sort of enjoying the communality of the place yet in practice the polynia and its inhabitants uh, and the Polynia has never been perceived as a flatland of multiple species among which the hunters could pick and choose the day's menu. It was simply a, sta a place where they could possibly get uh, some game. The animals were never aligned in practice, nor were they, um, at the sa nor were they there at the same time. Relations between people and animals were always differentiated and determined as much by season as by social values rather than an abstract taxon taxonomy of species living from each other in regular uh, ways. Thus, the polar bear, for instance, always occupied a very special position owing to its status as both hunted and hunter, it still does, by the way, entitling it to a particular respect. And until recently, bear hunting was free in the entire region, given its prominent position within the larger social ecology. Uh, uh, the, the sledge dogs could be amply fed from its meat, as could people, but the fur for clothing was the crux of the matter, both when it came to the hunter's clothing, because it's so amazingly cold to, to drive these sledges and, and the sea ice in wintertime when it goes down to minus 40 or even in springtime. And it was also the bare clothes that marked the, the becoming of a man in the first place. So it's still the rule now in, in, the, in the region that boys are given their first bearskin trousers at their confirmation and they are going to serve them for the rest of their lives as hunters, hopefully. Or they may need new ones in the future. But the thing is now that, that uh, the bear uh, skins are becoming scarce because the polar bears are restricted and, 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 and have become, the polar bear hunt has become restricted and they have moved away from the easy, uh, easily accessible regions. So access to bears is, is, bears is greatly hampered by the dwindling of sea ice and so is, of course, it affects the sense of, of who they are. I mean, they're perfectly modern, they know what, what's going on, but they still have sort of a great feeling for these bearskin trousers. Another, war, another animal of concern is the walrus. Since prehistoric times, walrus bone has been used for artwork and trade, and until recently, uh, it has been a vital source of meat for both humans and dogs. With a decrease in ice cover, access by sledge to the walrus's haul-out places has become more complicated, and in some years, even impossible. While no longer actually a delight for people, for themselves to eat, the dogs still need it, and they suffer a lot from the meager supply of walrus meat. The inevitable meat caches of, of stone on the beaches are often empty now. In fact, dogs may starve, sometimes to death, during winter, leaving the less fortunate families with even more constricted mobility and less opportunity to hunt. When the light comes back, they have four months without sun, uh, and they can once again get to the ice edge if they have a working pack of dogs to drag their sledge. So again, the assembled world of humans and non-humans is multi-scalar, not taxonomic, and, uh, and uh, the ice is again sort of seen to be sort of a major agent in this uh, place, in, in this assemblage. One of the challenges uh, that anthropologists are faced with in the field is to assess and probably, properly describe the agency of the available resources. How may we balance our knowledge without ending up once again in new forms of separation between the natural and the social dimensions, such as the soil and the peasant, the marine mammal and the arctic hunter, or the monsoon and the, the, uh, the uh, fishermen in, in, uh, in the Bay of Bengal? The point is that whatever we are defining or undefining as living or social, humans are the definers. We can only, and I quote Anna Tsing here, we can only know more than human socialities through our human knowledge practices, including practices of living. 
end of quote. It is these knowledge practices that we must refine to fit the fluid world, and I think this symposium sort of takes us a long way towards that, that goal, towards a, a refinement. And this takes me actually to India very briefly, where Frida Hastrup, who was a collaborator in the Waterworks project, studied a coastal community in Tamil Nadu in the aftermath of the Asian tsunami during successive years. I mean, she studied them during successive years and found that the catastrophe was gradually enfolded into the ordinary, so to speak, including in, into the incessant talks about wind and weather and not least the monsoon. The latter was generally depicted as a time of heavy downpours, indistinct fevers, and seen as being out of control. As she noted, the break of routines that followed, whether in fishing or in school activities, were not always related to the actualities of the weather. Downpours and odd winds might prevail, but so might calm and bright sunny days, equally letting children off school with reference to the rainy season. Everything was sort of summed up in the notion of the rough season, that is the season when the northeast monsoon would normally sweep over Tamil Nadu as if it were both a regular and a well-defined time space. But it turned out to be a kind of ordering device that could be extended to incorporate uh, different kinds of disasters, uh, such as a tsunami and an accidental drowning, and she sort of tells the stories about this. The tsunami was luckily a one-time event yet it was in, enfolded into the ordinary notions of the environment, seen and classified as increasingly anomalous even years after the event. And she relates, During the first couple of weeks of March 2008, a series of heavy rainfall swept over the village. This was highly unexpected, as the monsoon season was normally limited to the months October, November, December. That was their own reckoning. Among the fishermen, there was talk of this being an untimely rough season. Fishing was put on hold. Small canals leading the rainwater away from the houses were dug. Sandbags were put around the houses to keep the water out, and the villagers quickly settled to wait for better days. The ill-timed rain seemed once again to, to, uh, to remind the fishermen that the ability to predict weather conditions and thus to practice their everyday activities had been shaken, and they gave rise to a legion of remarks that connected the seasonal abnormity with the tsunami, which in, ter in turn was seen as connected with climate change. Murugan, one of the local fishermen, would ponder, and she quotes him, look at this rain, it's not even the rough season, all these changes, I don't know, I think they have come to stay. End of quote from Frida Hasdrup. By this quotation, I want to suggest that just like animal talk uh, by the high Arctic oasis defies conventional schemes of taxonomic classification and alignment, so weather talk in Tarankambadi defies customary seasonal organization. In both cases, people seek to deal with the new unpredictability of the environment, new actually should be supplied with a question mark, we don't really know how new it is, by devising new strategies of, de of forecasting. This is one of the consequences of the liquid fears that haunt the globe, glimpsed everywhere but nowhere to be seen, as Sigmund Baumann has it. And the cases dealt with here teaches, teach us not to take classification and speciation of animals or seasons at face value. We need to recognize a need for non-scalability theory to understand how such multi-species landscapes work, as Anna Ting again has it, about this non-scalability theory. So we are back in the Arctic landscape here. But in general, this is a, the key to understanding the fluid worlds with which we all live at the present moment. We cannot fix the fluidity and remain true to the lived world. Water is what we make of it, and the, mo and the moment it is fixed, whether in a hydrological cycle, a sea ice community, or in a rough season, it begs new questions. And now for the final part, on turbulence or the indeterminacy of the field. In the Tula region, life has always unfolded in dialogue with place, as constituted from, both from within and without through various climate fluctuations, materialities, and animal companions, 
a non-scalable assemblage, certainly. <laughs> um, today, the people are obviously connected to the rest of the world, but then they all, always were, even when they were not yet known outside of the big north itself. It is easy to see how human life in Tula is intricately linked up with the global challenges of the Anthropocene. Yet this again is an external image. From within the landscape that has been unintentionally designed for them, it is the daily struggle for income in some form that sets the frame for action. People live in a condition of manifest precarity, and as they do in other parts of the world affected by unruly waters. One of the actual um, implications of the Anthropocene, as described by Anna Ting in the following way, a precarity that is an quote here at some length. Precarity is a condition of being vulnerable to others. Unpredictable encounters transform us. We are not in control, even of ourselves. Unable to rely on a stable structure of community, we are thrown into shifting assemblages, which remake us as well as our others. We can't rely on the status quo. Everything is in flux, including our ability to survive. Thinking through precarity changes social analysis. A precarious world is a world without teleology. In determinacy, the unplanned nature of time is frightening, but thinking through precarity makes it, evi makes it evident that indeterminacy also makes life possible." End of quote. This precarious world is one of the most pertinent anthropological concerns about the human condition in the 21st century. In the presentation of motley details from various regions above, the main argument has been that even a comprehensive global forces are processed from within located experience and from the minutiae of lived life. This is what may add up to new insights into the indeterminate forms of social life. It is also from there we can meaningfully discuss when and how changes in degree may become irreversible changes in kind. The fluidity and indeterminacy of the watery fields we are studying, and that we've heard a lot about in this uh, symposium here, teach us to keep things open while assembling the elements that will eventually become part of a more comprehensive analysis of the ever-shifting natural social world. David Turnbull has provided an interesting example from turbulence research, which he entered as a field worker in order to understand how unfixed forms may be theorized. Briefly, turbulence research, and I'm sort of implicitly sort of just quoting him, turbulence research seeks to understand and model such diverse phenomena as waterfalls, cloud formations, smoke plumes from erupting volcanoes or water whirls. And according to Turnbull, these phenomena are too disordered, too chaotic, even too natural to be hemmed in by mathematical models. Yet they may be depicted. You have, what we have here is an instance of sort of ice turbulence. I argue just to show you this picture, in a, in a sense, which I love. <laughs> uh, uh, and and, and um, he cites one of the turbulence researchers for saying, and I quote him quoting the turbulence researcher, we don't even have a definition for turbulence, although it is generally agreed that it has the following properties. It is unsteady three-dimensional, apparently random, dissipative, and has motions which are, which are spread over a range, uh, wide range with non-linear interactions along the scales. This is not very precise, but still. And Turnbull adds on his own account. Yet despite the lack of consensus, there is sufficient coherence for the practitioners to act as if there is a field of turbulence research. Coherence in, in this case does not derive from a unifying paradigm or the adoption of an agreed set of instruments or methods. It derives from a very loose recognition that the phenomenon at issue is turbulence, even though its nature cannot be specified, and even though it occurs in a very diverse set of flow situations, from blood vessels to aircraft wings to the Earth's atmosphere. But equally important, coherence results from the work of the researchers in the field trying to establish equivalences and connections in problem solving while also struggling for authority. 
end of quote. While actual turbulent research is both local and messy, there is a shared interest in assembling knowledge from into a more comprehensive field through a continual exchange and emerging agreement of how to impose some order onto nature through the collective work on practitioners in the area. The kind of uh, ordering um, that is achieved, the kinds of ordering that are achieved are contingent depending on the ways in which the situated actors locally deploy a wide variety of elements in the assemblage, including theory, tools and funds. So there's a lot of things going into sort of discovering what turbulence is here. Um, agreement is of course as tenuous as turbulence is indeterminate. And this, I would claim to be sort of a shared scholarly sensation in turbulent times such as this one. Indeterminacy ever even seems to accelerate at present, not only in the field of turbulence research, but certainly also in other branches, including anthropology, working in ever-changing worlds, and of course by default focusing on changes and, and sort of troubled waters and what have you. Uh, because they are so manifestly um, there. As Vincent Crapanzano has suggested, it, that is anthropology, should always be pluralized in its national trajectories and across those trajectories. The beauty of the field lies in its fluidity, its resistance to tight compartmentalization and territorialization. Sorry. It is, in essence, an interstitial discipline. And I think most of, most of us who are anthropologists, and there are quite a few in this room, we wouldn't know what he's talking about here, but it's because it seems that we're always sort of hooking on to other disciplines and, and sort of finding ourselves in between acting as interpreters across uh, boundaries. I worked a lot with biologists and archaeologists, and, so I, and, and I'm also the interpreter between the, the people and these scientists. So, so we, we have this interstitial role, which I think is very important. I would take this further to scholarship more broadly, where the outpour of work and, for instance, dwindling ice cover in the north and accelerating monsoon anomalies leave us in no doubt about the fundamental indeterminacy of the global climate system. The Anthropocene scene seems to accelerate this further under the weight of its interpreters competing to produce small and large-scale conclusions about sea level and ice and rain anomalies, to the degree where one must ask all over again whatever we should mean by an anomaly in this era and on which temporal and spatial scale. The challenge is that the elements of the Earth, they keep running their own course, deeply affected by humans, obviously, but they could not care less about anomalies. They just run on. Modern science adds to the global unease by taking its own tradition of rationality and precision too seriously and bracketing alternative ways of thinking. I'm not suggesting at all that we give up on natural sciences, but that we listen more carefully to other ways of expressing concerns and learn from the fishermen of Tamil Nadu, for instance, to think about the monsoon anomalies as, as integral parts of the real world in which one has to live. We cannot ever externalize the anomalous once it affects our lives. Our here, including ordinary people all over the world whose rationalizations have been bracketed. Yet we should realize that anomalies are always defined, not simply discovered, and are therefore human const constructs. They're part of this vocabulary that we develop in the scientific community. Interestingly, uh, international legal bodies such as the United Nations Convention of, on the Law of the Sea work on a similar assumption of unilinear, unilinear rationality, for instance, when it comes to the regulation of living resources on which the hunters uh, in the Tula region depend. In a clause on the conservation of living resources, it is stated that, and I quote the paragraph here, states shall take measures which are designed on the best scientific evidence 
available to the states concerned to maintain or restore populations of harvested species at levels which can produce the maximum sustainable yield as qualified by relevant environmental and economic factors, including the special requirements of developing states and taking into account fishing patterns, the interdependence of stocks and any generally recommended international minimum standards, whether sub-regional, regional or global. Whoever can live by such a clause? I mean, there's so many parameters sort of affecting the actual content of this while claiming to be sort of purely rational and self-evident. It is superfluous to point out the incompatibility between such a well-meaning clause and the reality, the lived reality of, say, the Tula hunters. For them, the North Water reality is much more messy and much more uh, sort of, um, it has much more meaning. Neither species nor state are aligned in their experience. Scientific evidence is questionable because it is generally detached from place. Clearly, protection of endangered species is of utmost concern to the hunters, but a discussion between states is invariably a discussion of numbers rather than meanings and of species rather than meat and bearskin trousers. Such incompatibility at the level of real life points to the need for keeping the waters open for multiple interpretations and, of course, a lot of conversations across these divides. And it's perfectly possible to talk across them. I mean, there's no, no problem if you just take your time. This is where we need a new kind of science for the Anthropocene, I suggest, a more daring one, and by implication, a more realistic one. It is all the mo more important between, because we, the humans are the only ones with a language in which to discuss the turbulent times, the turbulent relations with which we are faced, and the only ones with knowledge practices that make it possible to share knowledge across the globe and across the species, although not always easily. The difficulty in, in, uh, in, in, in this sort of talking across and this sort of established paradigms, I think I have found in a, in a recently article by Lou et al. And describing the uh, dealing with the southeast monsoon and describing the as yet opaque influence on the southeast monsoon rains by, and I quote them here, by other weather systems such as the Arctic Oscillation, Siberian High and Western Subtropical High, as well as the complex Asian topography, i.e. the Siberian Plateau. This is end of quote. With all due respect, this is a heaping of thing upon thing, uh, even as it, uh, and, and, that, and of uncertainty to certainty. They have a conclusion, but then they suggest in the end that it's all affected by all these other factors that we don't know enough about. So even as it bows to science, it, it remains sort of uncertain in its, um, in its conclusion. It is an appeal to a context that remains undefined while allegedly supplying some external causes in Siberia and the Arctic, wherever, for local troubles. So it's within the, the bounds of a particular kind of science, but it's also pointing to the fact that it's very difficult to have all of it in one picture. There is a challenge here for all of us to identify a figure and ground in a world where the ground itself is liquefying to paraphrase, paraphrase Helmreich from his study of the alien ocean. Times are indeed li liquid, as Bauman has suggested, and for him, him it reshapes human virtue. Uh, the virtue proclaimed to serve the individual, and I quote him here, to serve the individual's interests best is not conformity to rules, but flexibility, a readiness to change tactics and style at short notice, to abandon commitments and loyalties without regret, and to pursue opportuni opportunities according to their current availability rather than following one's own established preferences. We could extend this to science, including sea ice and monsoon research, uh, recognizing the indisputable elusiveness of place. And now concluding on reading the Anthropocene. It, it is relatively short, rest assured here. Yeah. Water literacy is a notion which is spreading, it seems. Uh, a 
And for some time it has been cast in the global north as, and I have a quote here, knowing where your water comes from and how you use it, including the basic understanding of water footprints, virtual water, groundwater recharge, and consequences of overdrafting, how to move and control surface water, competing demands for water, and water conservation. Still, although it's, it, it's claimed to be sort of local water literacy, this is from the Sahel area, it's still sort of within the vocabulary of, of science. But anyway, I think that um, in this uh, paper, I have wanted to move beyond such definitions and open up for new understandings within the global weather system. The, uh, the larger point the larger point is that water itself offers new ways of thinking and theorizing about the world, which has so far been thought of mainly in terms of lands, nations, and sedentary social forms. Focusing on water as and on, and on liquid worlds, as you have all done in this symposium, enable us to theorize societies in constant movement as they reformat themselves in response to incre increasingly fluid and indeterminate environments and to new Anthropocene challenges, including the atmospheric brown cloud and other toxic legacies. As suggested uh, in a recent article, we need serious and solid science and society interactions to grasp, comprehend, communicate, and ultimately perhaps try to tame some of the wickedness of the anthropogenized ocean. And that was for this article by Pasha and Bonstorff that I cited before. But I would like to end by returning to Anna Tsing, whom I cited about, above on the precariousness of the present, and remind us that, and I quote a sentence from that longer quote again here, thinking through precarity changes social analysis. A precarious world is a world without teleology. In determinacy, the unplanned nature of time is frightening, but Thinking through precarity makes it evident that indeterminacy also makes life possible. End of quote. I find this st statement liberating and in tune with the far from teleological development of the earth, now as before, including the fluid environments we strive to read. Water and other literacies must exceed themselves and contribute to the development through challenging analysis that open up for new forms of understanding and hence for action. And with this, I'll just say thank you. Thank you. Uh, oh, yeah. Another uh, brilliant presentation. So I'm, it's, I'm just a humble international relations theorist. I don't know much <laughs> about uh, water studies and architecture. That's perfectly but, um, <laughs> you know, but I am getting a bit confused because times are liquid, wetness is everywhere. Um, I'm not sure where the metaphors start and end and where the empirics starts and ends. And, um, Maybe water studies could be like a problematic area because surely when we're talking about liquidity and fluidity, we're, we're really meaning to apply those in a conceptual way against the classifications and divisions of, of the world rather than a, in a literal way. And I'm, I'm sort of, it's not always clear to me what's doing the work, whether it's the empirics or whether it's the broader conceptualization. And isn't there something disingenuous in water studies that sort of tries to maybe not colonize a disciplinary field, but make out that there's something more liquid about water than <laughs> bricks and mud and anything else? I don't think there is. Thank you, David. Let's have Pushpa. OK. Yeah. Yeah. My question is also slightly related. I love your work, Kirsten. I'm really happy to be here to listen to you in person. Um, 
so within urban studies, there's this planetary urbanization discourse, which argues that almost everything is urban. And so they look at the most uh, unlikely of the mm. uh, examples, so illustrating through Arctic, uh, through the Amazonia, that the urban pervades uh, the planet. And uh, so it's quite popular in, within urban studies to construct a geograph geographical imagination through water. So Mediterranean is urban, Arctic is urban, the polar is urban, Indian Ocean is urban. And yet, in your talk, when you, you know, cut across all these different geographies, um, you very <laughs> cleverly maybe avoided the use of uh, urban or the rural, any of these usual I know you've talked about avoiding the taxonomies, non-taxonomical mm. approach, but you avoided the notion of these very classic binaries that we are all trained to look at. So then how do you construct an imagination of the environment without some of these basic you know, building blocks? And what is it that you see here as a planetary discourse then, considering the fact that it's Anthropocene that we are talking about? Yeah. Well, the, the, those are huge questions, and, and they're very good questions, actually, and I, I, I'm, I'm very glad to be challenged to, to think more about it. It's not that I haven't thought about it, it's just that sometimes one may get too captured away by one's own words, and making it sort of seem imprecise where precision is, is needed. But, but to, to David's question, I mean, I think, um, for me, there's not necessarily a huge distinction between metaphors and sort of descriptive terms. Uh, I don't think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a different register. And I think the thinking in, in the terms we are thinking with or thinking through or applying are anyway sort of co-formatting what we see. Uh, and, or, and the other way around, what you see sort of gives rise to certain sens sensations of being in a world of flux or whatever. So I think it's, it's not, um, and I think that's, that's one of the problems I think or challenges we have to face in anthropology because we get sort of caught up in our fields in a very bodily way and, and sort of we tend to think the field from within and then of course we move out and make comparative analysis and, and sort of try to generalize across fields. But, but in certain areas, notably these I mean, as I said, I worked with these, uh, this water worlds project and there was water all over the place. So it, it naturally, that was a place where we could sort of share vocabularies. But it's not that there was more to it. It's just what I've focused on here. But I think it's, it's a very, very good point and one I should perhaps like to pursue more consistently and more, more conceptually in, in later. But I, I cannot do much more here except apologize <laughs> for, for having created confusion. But, uh, but uh, also, uh, as in, in, in Pushka's case, I mean, what I'm really uh, uh, question here, I think what is uh, interesting is that I, I'm trying to get away from binaries. But of course, if you, if you keep harping on fluidity, then what's the other thing? <laughs> That's sort of fixity. And, and, uh, and, and of course, sometimes you have to fix something in language, but, uh, but, it, but it's not really fixed in, in, uh, necessarily in, in, in real life. Then new challenges will open up the language for new expressions, I think. And certainly in, in this particular case, the urban rural makes no sense at all. I mean, obviously. <laughs> I mean, there is no urban conglomerates up there, and uh, there is no rural area. I mean, it's, it's all hunting and sea ice or, or open water in the, in the summer season and moving about in, in kayaks or on dog sledges. So it's, it's, complete, it's, it's a world unto itself. But what I really wanted was to, to, to make or hope to achieve was to make you see that even this far away, rather sort of unique place, and not many people living that way anyway, in fact, no one actually, uh, is sort of part of the modern world, they're susceptible, they're, they're part of the same landscape and affected by the same global forces as people elsewhere. And, uh, and, and also, I think for me it matters also to say that they're entirely modern, that's what I say there. As well. I mean, they're living in the modern world, they know everything that's goes on, going on. They read the ICCP reports on, on climate change, etc. And 10 years ago they got, uh, uh, got teleconnection or Internet, so so they 
and I started uh, working there 10 years ago and that, until then they relied on sort of other kinds of, of input and information but now they're very very computer literate and, and they know what's going on and they're keenly following the discussions about restrictions on the animals etc and, and uh, so they're they're part of the same world as the rest of us that's really what I wanted to say Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, um, I just have a question actually on turbulence and, uh, yeah. you know, and, uh, and the citing of turbulence. Mm. Yeah. You know? I mean, that, uh, in, the, in the act of citing turbulence. With a C, citing. Yeah, I mean, of, of or waters. Or with a S. Of unruly waters. Or yeah. Uh, yeah, citing yeah. the S. Yeah, citing the S, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's right. I mean, and, yeah. um, and so it is, uh, it comes actually with an anchoring in a paradigm, actually, that, that, uh, yeah. that is basically not turbulent, so you can see turbulence in a sense. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's, mm -hmm. some, there's some kind of a structure there that sits, uh, sits comfortably for you to identify discomfort in a way. I mean, that, you know, so yeah. that anchoring actually mm -hmm. in, uh, in a science that then is calling for a more daring science. Um, mm -hmm carries a bit of a problem for me. Yeah. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm trying to figure out how to yeah. actually, how you yeah. handle that. I mean, you know, it's like, yeah. it's like uh, Daniel Botkin's uh, discordant harmonies, yeah. uh, you know, that where he actually argues for a science uh, of, uh, you know, that accommodates discordance uh, and yeah. does away with the paradigms that actually, you know, uh, make sense. But, uh, but, the, but that element actually also of, of identifying it grounded in a paradigm, yeah. um, I mean, I assume allows you actually some, I mean, a more critical stance. I'm not sure where that comes from. But to some extent, it is also, it also comes with this burden, actually, that one carries of uh, determining indeterminacy. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. how do you actually argue that point uh, conceptually? I think that is a very good question, actually. And, and uh, I hadn't thought so much about the fact that turbulence research was, of course, anchored in, in ordinary natural science because I've been focusing on the fact that they were content with less than sort of scientists ordinarily would be with sort of fixed forms and, and, and fixed conclusions. I mean, it's much more open as far as I've been able to read. And uh, I, I, I have talked about this with a physicist working with turbulence in, 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 at the Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen. And, and um, you know, even he said that we, we don't know what it is, but it gives us a term to talk about that which isn't immediately sort of bound to something else, which isn't immediately uh, fixed and which cannot perhaps ever be it. And it covers a lot of different things. And I like that. I like the idea that, uh, that there is something like turbulence in many different fields affecting many different materials, many different worlds from the air to the sea to, to, to whatever, really. So I was just somehow taken by this, uh, the richness and the volatility of this particular uh, natural scientific field and the vocabulary on, of uncertainty that they admit to, which I think is, is refreshing. But it, of course, it doesn't make perhaps any difference in the long term. It's just, just one of these words that I chose to, to think through uh, in, in sort of trying to hem in what's going on in the world, because everything seems now up in the air, more or less. I mean, if I may just follow up uh, sure. briefly. Uh, you know, when, when one puts it that way, actually, there is uh, always this, uh, there's an us and a them mm -hmm. know, in, in relationship to communities like this. You know, I mean, and, and so there is, I know, a large debate, actually, of what constitutes indigenous knowledge, and, you know, and, and where does that paradigm end? And if that, I mean, how does that actually sit in the realm of difference? Uh, but, um, yeah. but that tension, you know, so when one talks about turbulence, is this turbulence that is shared everywhere. And so you become the spokesperson for humanity uh, yeah. and the structuring of, of, of humanity. And so the Anthropocene <coughs> also carries this mm -hmm. burden where everybody is criminalized, actually. Um, and uh, are there people in the world who do not share this us uh, and do not share the Anthropocene? And so sometimes I mean, there are people who are arguing that this should not be the Anthropocene, it should be the Europocene. 
or something of that structure yeah, yeah. rather than rather than anthro. Yeah. How do you actually address that? Uh, as a, is that a concern at all? It, it, it is a concern, but uh, I haven't made it my concern in this particular context here. Because I think in many ways it is a useful term. It reminds us of all the anthropogenic forces that sort of disturb sort of different sort of well-established patterns uh, in, in the environmental, uh, in, in, in various environments. But, um, but you're right. I mean, we shouldn't use it too easily because we all know what we are talking about, but then do we really? <laughs> because as, I mean, these sort of the depths of the ocean, everything that is in flux and I possibly, I mean, if we were to use it properly, we should sort of extend it backwards to, I don't know, 10,000 years ago, because when did it start and why and how? What is it and, and, and why is it now mainly used to blame particular countries even? It may be, all right, but I mean, we should be careful not to, 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 to let slip past our sort of normal filter of, uh, of a selection of terms. So, so that's about the Anthropocene, but uh, the, the us, them, I think that, that's one dichotomy I really want to, to, to dismantle because it's, it's, it, it's not, it doesn't work anywhere. It, there isn't an us and a them. Of course, there are people we know better than others. But it's not the ancient us-them dichotomy, certainly not in, in, in anthropology, the anthropology that I know of, well, because we are all part of the same planet, we live with the same plights, and uh, of course there may be some that are more adventurous than others, but, but every person is, is sort of modern in the sense of being, of being implicated. In, in the modern world. And this notion about indigenous knowledge, I think, is also a great hoax because, I mean, once you're there, they answer your questions. So how clean <laughs> is the indigenous knowledge? And people translate themselves readily into different registers depending on who asks the question. Mm -hmm. So I think I, I see it as more as an open-ended conversation between people that may come from different parts of the world, but who find themselves together and enjoy it, as I've enjoyed working with these people. And, and they, I mean, they, I mean, now I'm generalizing as them, which I don't do normally because they are individuals like the most, like rest of us. But, but, but they are getting sick of people coming to their region, making films and wanting to, 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 to film the last Eskimos or whatever all these sort of, and the last indigenous peoples and, and all these technologies that they have. And for them, it's just daily life. Mm -hmm. and, and they're beginning to, to say, we don't want to work with you anymore. At first, of course, it was another avenue of income, but now they're getting so sick of having to pose and also having to accommodate people who, who are there for one week and they want to see a narwhal catch and a walrus and blah, 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 which is impossible. It's, it's mm -hmm. all seasonal, it takes a year to, to even get close to all of these events. So, so I mean, they're they are not seeing themselves as indigenous in any way. Mm -hmm. They they see themselves as people who live in a particular place mm -hmm. and they want to remain there and that's why they want recognition from the Greenlandic uh, self-rule government and uh, now they have it. And they feel pleased. <laughs> Harsh, are there any other questions or shall Harsh be the last one? Yeah, good. Uh, Kirsten, thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed that. So much to think about. Um, but uh, amongst a bunch of questions I had, the one that um, I, I really want to ask is the is the is the is the trope, the device, or the the function of trouble, which Donna Haraway, Anna Singh, and you mm. now use as well. In terms of, I mean, you're, you're obviously using this with 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 waters and fluid. But I, I'm wondering. <laughs> for the potential of trouble within discipline, because trouble mm. and discipline yeah. are, mm. I mean, it's, 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 it's interesting what trouble does to discipline, what yeah. does to structure, what does to, uh, I mean, anthropology, politics. And mm. so I was wondering, what are the modes of trouble for you that help you think and, and operate in this work? Because I mean, is, is, is trouble something that opens up the conversation? Is trouble something that opens up a new set of references? 
is trouble a mode of inquiry or is trouble a mode of uh, elemental f tracking like the water? And so I was just wondering what trouble meant in that sense because yeah. trouble is this, is, is this really interesting empowering device and I was just wondering how you were uh, interested in thinking about it. Yeah, I think what it does to me is to open up for analysis. I mean, it's, it, it becomes an analytical term. You see it in a particular way and then you see what that does to to your word, but, but of course it is, it is also just a word <laughs> that we may use it in many different ways. And sometimes I think this in itself sort of keeps things open and, and you troubles, I mean a notion like that, you can, you can use it across a lot of different specializations within anthropology. Troubled waters, troubled bodies, troubled genders, troubled whatever. And, and, and because it, it opens up for a particular non, uh, non-aligned analysis in the first place and then you can see what happens but I mean what I really wanted to say in in, in the towards the end here was that I think we should take the the times as I mean in, in a sense they're promising because they allow us to 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 refashion our disciplines so that they may somehow remain coherent but but not on the same old premises because now we 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 work across ancient divides also between disciplines, but also between continents and between uh, elementals. <laughs> uh, and, and I think we, we should, uh, should stick with it a little longer, this uh, notion of trouble, and see where it may take us in, into these sort of inter interstitial places where things, new things may happen. I think, in, in, again, in the manner of speaking, I think anthropology stands at a watershed which is, of course, another metaphor or a real thing. Uh, and, uh, and, and we have to make up our minds whether to go on sort of being protectionist, uh, I mean, by sort of working on the ground or by being respectful, by sort of talking, uh, by, by sort of sharing their and our knowledge with, with other disciplines, other fields. Good. Well, thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you.